say a few things about uh, where we had stopped um, last week. So we were talking about alloying elements. And um, so we'd start, we talked about uh, chromium and moly, molybdenum. And uh, we just uh, were busy discussing the impact of boron. Hmm? And um, I had shown you this example. So normally, um, these are, these are uh, what we call the uh, primer, the um, uh, uh, austenite uh, grain boundaries. So this is where you would expect ferrite to nucleate. This is, this is an example here where the steel is boron free and you interrupted the nucleation uh, by quenching the uh, steel, so uh, the untransformed austenite is present as martensite, and you can see, you can very nicely see the, the ferrite having nucleated at the grain boundaries. Now, if you add boron, you can see the same grains, yes, uh, grain boundaries rather, and there's absolutely no ferrite on these grain boundaries. So the boron is present at these grain boundaries, is very strongly enriched there, and, um, and prevents the nucleation of ferrite. So you get, as a consequence, when you look at, for instance, the, uh, this um, TTT diagram here, you see here the, the top part of the TTT diagram is related to ferrite formation, you know that the lower part is uh, related to other decomposition reactions, so that's martensite and, and uh, bainite formation. But the top part here, um, in the same steel, it now added boron, you can see that the transformation is retarded, yes? That's a, as a consequence of this boron addition, okay? The, um, uh, never forget that um, if you look at um, TTT diagrams, yes, they're not only a function of the composition, yes, but they will be different also depending on the microstructure. And there are two important uh, microstructural features that the austenite can have before it transforms it can have a smaller grain size of a, or a very large grain size. That will impact the transformation behavior also. And another parameter that is of importance, microstructural parameter, is whether or not the austenite is deformed. Because you can transform, you can make ferrite from a recrystallized austenite. You can also make ferrite from deformed, plastically deformed um, uh, austenite. Hmm? For instance, uh, you uh, deform a material in a rolling mill, yes, and it's cooling down, and it's um, uh, cooling down faster than it can recrystallize, well, then you will form uh, ferrite inside this deformed uh, austenite. But let's first have a look at the grain boundary, the effect of the grain boundary. So um, I already told you that, um, get a pen here, that um, when you have uh, austenite to ferrite decomposition, the ferrite forms at the boundaries, yes? You get nucleation, yes. But now imagine that you have the same steel, but now the grain boundary density is much higher. For instance, instead of having this, just this one boundary, I have now four times as many boundaries. I just stuck these pictures together and reduced the size. What I basically did here is reduce the size of the grains, right? But you can see here, obviously, that I will form a lot more nuclei, yes, and that I will have a faster, that I must have a faster transformation, just purely on the basis of a smaller grain size. So if the grain size of 
os the, the, the microstructure one is smaller than the grain size of microstructure two, then the time to achieve a certain um, uh, the, the, a, a certain uh, tra amount of transformation, hmm? for instance, this time here, to achieve a certain amount of transformation. This is a, the, the, the dotted line and the, the full line uh, are for the same amount of transformation. Yeah? Um, if it takes me T2 star seconds to uh, transform the microstructure with the larger grain size, then it will take me T1 star seconds to deform the, uh, to transform the same amount of uh, austenite with a smaller grain size. And the relation will be um, that T1 is equal to D1 divided by D2 times T2. And, and that's obviously smaller than uh, T2 star, yes? And the, the smaller the grain size, the faster the transformation, yes? So your TTT diagram, your CCT, CCT diagrams are always for a specific grain size, yeah? And if your grain size is smaller, transformation can be lots, lots faster, okay? Same thing with deformation. With deformation, the C curve, say we are in a TTT diagram, the C curve for transformation without um, um, deformation is here. So this would be, um, for instance, I'm cooling at this particular rate, yes? Then the point where the transformation start, as you know, is called the AR3 temperature, right? So th this is the AR3 for that particular cooling rate. Hmm? If I do a transformation from a deformed austenite, the strain, the transformation will be will start earlier, yes, and at higher temperatures. Yeah? So why is that? Well, there are two effects. One of them is a kinetic effect, and the other one is a thermodynamic effect. Hmm? First of all, what is the thermodynamic effect? When when you have a phase and it's deformed, its energy is increased. So it's less stable. Hmm? It's higher energy, it's less stable. So um, I will have a higher uh, driving force for the transformation. Hmm? That's, that's a, th a general thermodynamic uh, uh, factor. The other factor is a kinetic factor when I have deformed uh, material, microstructure, there are lots more nucleation sites for the transformation. And these two effects together increase the uh, rate of transformation. So um, I can say I have an, the, the CC, the, the TTT curve here will move to the left, yeah? so it will get faster hmm? because I have a higher nucleation rate it's like having a smaller grain size if you want, right? I have more nuclei in the microstructure. And then it also increases, so the, the, the transformation starts earlier because I have a higher free energy for the deformed austenite. Okay? So let, let me show you an example here. So uh, of the strained transformation um, in a strained austenite. So if the austenite is not strained, we get the grain uh, boundaries for austenite. Yeah? And at these grain boundaries, you form um, uh, ferrite. And now we look at the same microstructure, but we, we deform the material, 12%, 40%, 60%, yes? And then we quench it, yes? And we see in the, look in the microstructure, and what do we see is that now, uh, as you deform the, the uh, austenite, you can see that inside the grains, you now start to see ferrite nuclei. Here you can also see a grain, yes? And you can see that inside the grain, you form ferrite nuclei. And this is a heavily deformed material. Inside the grain, you can see a lot of very fine 
additional ferrite nuclei. So you get a much faster transformation. And because you have so much, so many uh, ferrite nuclei, you will have reduced the grain size very effectively. And this is this idea to transform from deformed strained austenite is the key to thermomechanical processing. Hmm? Okay. Um, so, so let's just wrap up um, the review of uh, our um, um, the alloying elements in, in steel in general. So uh, there are uh, in, uh, just uh, you don't have this slide. I'm um, I'm sorry. I just uh, made it because uh, I noticed it was, uh, but it's it's not a, a fundamental thing. So we we generally divide our um, alloying elements into ferrite stabilizers or austenite stabilizers, and that's basically on how does the uh, binary iron element uh, look like. For instance, iron chrome, I see here that the austenite stability range, yeah, so that's the temperature uh, at which the austenite is stable, um, is uh, uh, contracted, or I've, I even form, in the case of this the chromium, I form a closed gamma loop. Yeah? So I call these elements that do this, that reduce the stability range of austenite, I call them ferrite stabilizers. You can see here that at 15% of chromium, yes, you don't even form austenite anymore. Right? So obviously, um, chromium is a strong ferrite stabilizer. Um, you have elements that do the reverse instead of um, uh, contracting the, um, the stability range. They expand it. Yeah? For instance, here at 25% of nickel, I don't have any ferrite anymore. So these elements we call austenite stabilizers. They create an expanded um, uh, gamma stability range or, or they open it. Okay? And, and so... Uh, so that is thermodynamic stability. Right? So, but the elements also have an impact on the um, TTT diagram, and this is a, an example here of uh, what they do. Right? So, some of them uh, we've explained, like boron uh, will will push back chromium, will uh, reduce the um, the transformation kinetics. We'll see late, a little bit later on when we talk about niobium uh, that it goes in the other direction because niobium allows us to stabilize uh, deformed austenite. Mm -hmm. uh, molybdenum also uh, suppresses the, um, uh, the perlite um, transformation. Uh, most of the alloying elements depress the, the MS temperature. So that, that is the, the, the explanation to this uh, diagram here. Um, so this this you do have in your notes, except I've, because it's so small um, on the screen. I've just uh, there, I have separated the ferrite stabilizing elements and the austenite stabilizing element discussion. So uh, so w when you look at um, the influence of uh, alloy elements, you have to to look at different facets. Uh, one element just doesn't do just one thing, yes? Mm -hmm. uh, usually it, it does multiple things. So you, you, in general, the first thing you have to do is uh, look at the phase diagram. Is it an element that uh, is, is ferrite stabilizer or austenite stabilizer? So does it uh, result in a closed gamma field or a contracted gamma field? Then it's a ferrite stabilizer. Um, most of the ferrite stabilizing uh, elements are substitutional elements, yes? With the exception of boron, which is interstitial. The, uh, because the, uh, these ferrite stabilizing elements uh, uh, reduce the austenite stability range, it means that the AR3 temperature will increase as you add these elements. Huh? Now, 
Um, important thing is what is the effect on the austenite decomposition of these elements? Do they form carbides or nitrides? Yeah, these are important points. And then certain um, elements uh, are uh, it's important to, to note a few things. So about the um, austenite um, decomposition. Yeah? Most elements, even though they are ferrite stabilizers, yes, when you add them to steel, they will slow down the transformation reaction. Yeah? So you'd think, well, I add, for instance, um, aluminum is a strong ferrite stabilizer. If you add aluminum to your steel, it doesn't mean that it, you will form ferrite faster. Yes? Why is that? Well, there, there are a number of effects, yes? For instance, that element, that particular element, can have an influence on the carbon diffusivity. It can slow down the carbon diffusivity. Why would that have an effect? Well, remember, when we're making, in steels, when we're making ferrite from, out of austenite, the carbon is partitioned between those two phases. The carbon has to leave the ferrite and go into the austenite. Why does it do that? Because the solubility of carbon in austenite is so low. Yeah? So whenever an element reduces the diffusivity of carbon, it also slows down the decomposition reaction. But that's one thing. The second one is that the elements themselves, yes, hmm? Um, rearrange themselves at the boundaries, at the phase boundaries. Hmm? So uh, you can have elements that enrich or are depleted at the boundary. Hmm? For instance, silicon, aluminum, chromium do not really partition, change place during the transformation, but they have a tendency to be either depleted or enriched at the interface. So they need to rearrange themselves, so that will slow down the kinetics of the reaction. And finally, there are elements that also do not partition, but have a tendency to stick around the phase boundary. Yes, they, they move with the phase boundary. And that is an effect that's called solute drag effect. Hmm? So, for instance, elements such as niobium and titanium, to a lesser extent vanadium, accumulate at the phase boundary, yes? And then they will slow down uh, the transformation. Mm -hmm. um, very many of the ferrite stabilizers are strong carbide formers. So that, that will also have an impact on the... Um, on the, on the transformation, yes, and on the microstructure you get. So, um, so chrome, vanadium, molybdenum, tungsten, titanium, niobium, and zir zirconium um, are uh, strong carbide formers. So the first ones, uh, you have a first type, those are the titanium carbide types, niobium carbide types. They don't, they're more stable than cementite. So as soon as you add a, even a very little bit of them, they will bind carbon faster and more effectively than iron, yes? So they will always get formed first before you form any cementite, hmm? high stability. You have other types of carbides which are slightly less uh, stable, yes? Uh, chrome, vanadium, and moly, if the concentration of these elements is not high enough, then they will dissolve and enrich in the cementite. Manganese, chrome, and uh, molybdenum at low, con low concentrations are typically enriched in cementite. So if you add, say, 1% or something, or less than 1% of chromium to a steel, a low carbon steel, you will not find chrome carbides, yes? You need to add four or five percent of chrome to form chrome carbides, yes? Um, industrial practice, yes? 
um, is very complicated. It's more complicated than what I've just said. Very often, the carbides that you form are not pure carbides. Uh, they're carbonitrides. Yes? So that means it's like a, a mixture where you get uh, carbon and nitrogen forming uh, compounds with uh, these elements, chrome, etc. Hmm? Um, right? The, these carbides and carbonitrides um, uh, uh, precipitate very strongly in ferrite and in particular during the transformation from austenite to ferrite. Why is that? Because of the solubility of these compounds in ferrite. So they're highly so more soluble in austenite and when you do the transformation to ferrite the solubility is much less. We'll talk about this in a moment. So they precipitate and form a lot of small precipitates. Um, uh, nitrites are also important but not fundamentally because we tend not to alloy our steels with nitrogen too much. Hmm? There are certain steels where we, where we do this but usually our nitrogen contents in steels is very low because it, they give rise to aging, aging phenomena. So changing of what is aging, that's a changing of mechanical properties as a function of time, yes. Something we don't like because you, know, you um, deliver material with certain properties, the material gets stored and then when it gets used it has to have the same properties than at the time you sold it, yes. Um, materials that contain nitrogen are very sensitive to aging, yes. So the properties, the mechanical properties will change after six months of storage. So you don't want this, and so we keep, that's the reason why we keep the nitrogen levels very low. Hmm? Uh, molybdenum and tungsten form carbides exclusively. They don't form uh, nitrides. Um, and the other elements, chrome, vanadium, titanium, um, and niobium, form uh, both, uh, can form nitrides and carbonitrides. And don't forget, um, uh, certain things we, we said about uh, elements, that silicon is an element that will uh, suppress carbide formation, yes? It will also suppress formation of um, uh, uh, perlite to a certain extent, but it promotes the formation of ferrite, yeah? Um, chromium suppresses bainite and ferrite transformation, yeah, promotes perlite, and molybdenum is very much an element we add whenever we want to promote bainite transformation. So it suppresses perlite and ferrite um, transformation. The um, austenite stabilizers are, well, we see a lot less, uh, not that many uh, strong austenite stabilizers in uh, carbon steels. Hmm? Um, again, what do they do with phase diagram? They expand the, the austenite field. Usually they are um, substitutional elements. Manganese is the main one. The other ones, nickel, cobalt, and copper, um, we don't use them very often. So it's basically manganese and then to uh, smaller, much smaller extents, nickel, and, and cobalt uh, only for special applications. Um, and however, uh, carbon and nitrogen are uh, austenite stabilizers. The AR3 temperature decreases, yes, as we add them because you expand the uh, field. Um, what do they do to the austenite decomposition? Again, always retarded, yes. Why is it always retarded? Hmm? Well, simply because we stabilize the austenite, so there is a free energy effect. Hmm? So you increase the stab stability of the austenite phase. And of course, um, the austenites, uh, uh, austenite stabilizing elements also need to partition during transformation, so that has an impact on the uh, transformation. Uh, Cobalt does not partition, it's just some information here. Um, and 
the austenite stabilizers are not carbide formers, except of course for carbon that is required. Mm -hmm. um, this is this is of course not G. This is, should be austenite, um, but I think it's okay in your in your table. Um, manganese doesn't really form a carbide. It's usually enriched in the cementite, however, and uh, same with nickel. Nickel is not uh, it doesn't form a carbide and is also not enriched in the carbide. So it's um, and they don't tend to form nitrite. So it's pretty pretty simple. And uh, the austenite stabilizer, well, basically it boils down to to manganese um, in for the low carbon steels. Okay. Good. So. Um, the elements um, and that we've discussed up to now, we kind of assume they were in solution, right? Um, so uh, if they're carbon, they can be in, in a sub, uh, interstitial solution. If it's manganese, it's in substitutional solution. So um, as I add more for some reason, hmm, I add more alloying elements, for instance, to achieve higher strength, yes? Um, there will come a point where this solution is supersaturated. You know, this, uh, we are beyond the solubility limit, and um, you can have uh, precipitates are formed. Precipitates uh, can form at grain boundaries, or they can form inside the grains. They can be intergranular. So let's talk a little bit about this. Um, there are many... Um, uh, precipitates in steel, they're very important. We try to control them. Yeah, that's one of the things we do with comp composition is controlling the precipitates. Here you see a titanium nitride precipitate. And you can see something has grown on this titanium nitride precipitate. You, manganese sulfide has formed in this particular case. Yes. Um, these precipitates can be very tiny. And for instance, this, these are some niobium carbide precipitates. They're fine. And if, we, if you look at them at very high magnification, yeah, you, you, you can see that it's, they can be very complex. This is like a very tiny uh, titanium nitride precipitate. And on top of this, a um, cap-like niobium carbide has precipitated, has used this um, titanium nitride as a heterogeneous uh, nucleation site. Hmm? All right. So uh, those, the, the main um, uh, precipitates, oh, before we, we um, uh, continue, the, the, we make the difference between inclusions and precipitates, yes? But they're not the same. Hmm? When, uh, so a precipitate is, is so inclusions is not a precipitate. Hmm? So, Yes. Um, inclusions are usually larger oxides or sulfide particles. Yes. Yes. That um, result from steel making. Hmm? That result from the steel making. Hmm? Uh, for instance, it can be alumina particles. Hmm? Uh, in precipitates. We usually have carbides. We talk about carbides or nitrides. Hmm? Also sulfides. And they tend to be small. And they're made during this, the processing of your steel. Hmm? The solid, uh, solid processing of the steel. Hmm? And they take, oh, yeah, so they, they're very small and these ones tend to be very large in comparison. So of these um, um, uh, precipitates in, in carbon steels, the, the most important ones are carbides. Yeah? 
And um, so if, if um, you look at the uh, periodic table, yes, uh, so this would be the uh, iron here. If iron forms um, a number of carbides, yes, the thermodynamic stable carbide is this semen type, yes? And we also form um, what we call transition carbides. Hmm? If at low temperature, when at low temperature you precipitate um, uh, carbides out of solid solution, supersaturated solid solution of ferrite, you don't form cementite. You form a transition carbide, which we call epsilon carbide or eta carbide or Fe2C, yes? These are transition carbides. If you wait long enough, yes, they will eventually disappear and be replaced by cementite, yes? But in many steels, in particular uh, those that are um, uh, heat treated, yes, uh, for short times at low, uh, low temperatures, uh, you form these kinds of transition carbides. Um, it, in principle, I, I, I said in, um, just um, a few minutes ago that uh, there were no manganese carbides. Yes, you can, you can make manganese carbides, but you never see them in steels because they're um, not stable enough. Hmm? So um, as we move uh, to the left-hand side of our uh, uh, periodic table, and we move from to chrome and vanadium, tit uh, vanadium, titanium, what we we go from less stable carbides to very stable carbides. Yeah? Uh, in particular, carbides such as titanium carbide, vanadium carbide, and niobium carbides. Yeah, these are very stable carbides and they don't form mixed carbides such as the um, uh, where they're mixed with uh, iron to form cementite. Mm -hmm. um, and I've also indicated the main uh, types of carbides that, that you observe mm -hmm. uh, in, in steels. Um, the, uh, for chrome, for instance, the, uh, the type of carbide that you get uh, evolves as you change the composition of your steel. And so the, the, you can see here that um, uh, as you uh, increase the, uh, excuse me, as you, um, you, you can't see it here, but as you increase the, the, the chrome content in, in a steel that contains both iron, carbon, and chromium, um, the type of uh, carbide that you get is different. You will, um, you will go, for instance, from uh, chrome 23 uh, uh, carbon 6 to chrome 7 carbon 3. So here the ratio, the ratio here is about four, uh, four chrome. Yes, the ratio here is about two. Yes, and um, uh, these uh, these types of carbides, yes, are you go from a softer carbide to a very hard carbide. Okay. Um, right, and these compounds, by the way, are called Heg compounds. Uh, yes, this is the main thing I, I wanted to, to say. All right. Okay, and this is, again, an um, example of what happens, yes, uh, in steels is that as you go in this table from left to right, you go from elements which, are, which have no uh, carbide-forming tendency, so silicon. Silicon, again, forms carbide. Okay, silicon carbides, very well known carbide. But in steels, you don't see silicon carbides. Okay, uh, and cobalt and nickel don't form carbides in general. So as you move to tungsten, molybden, and uh, uh, vanadium, hmm, 
uh, you go to uh, stronger carbide formers, yes, and elements such as chrome are also very strong carbide formers. Uh, manganese is intermediate carbide former, but um, you can see that um, as you go from left to right, the the ratio of the that particular element in the cementite to the car the that element in solution increases. So it these elements, the carbide forming elements will always have a tendency to partition to the um, uh, to the, the, the cementite. Yeah? Okay. And that is important, yes, because uh, that, that has an impact on the uh, the composition of your carbide, the composition of your steel, yes. Um, for instance, this is an example here hmm, about partitioning of chrome and uh, manganese between ferrite and cementite in a eutectoid steel, yes. Hmm. So, uh, so this is the partitioning coefficient, yes. Um, uh, normally, if there is no partitioning, if chrome in the steel and the chrome in the cementite is the same, yes? So this is like, you have cementite, lats, yes? So here's theta, alpha, theta, yeah? This is the distance, this is the chrome content, yes? If you, um, uh, so you, you do the transformation at 700 degrees C, yes? And you look at the beginning of the transformation, how much chrome is there in the cementite, how much is there in the ferrite, yes? And the ratio is one. But if you wait long enough, you see that the chrome, after one hour, two hour, 10 hours, is 15 times, yes? So the chrome has now um, enriched in the cementite, yes? Yes. Um, with time, yes, and, and can reach very high levels, yes, and this, so that means that, of course, this partitioning will have an impact on the properties of your, um, of your, um, of your um, perlite phase. The same here for um, uh, manganese, yes, you, it's just as a function of time, at a particular temperature, you see, uh, I see the austenite content increasing and then it's stable at 642. If I increase the temperature to 672, again, at the beginning of the transformation there is no partitioning, yes? And if you wait long enough, you have an enrichment of about 10 times of the manganese in the cementite, yes? Now, why would this be important? Well, for instance, remember that uh, when we have perlite, um, maybe this, uh, uh, for instance, these steels are perlitic steels, yes? We, maybe we want to make ball bearings with them, yes, with this steel, and so we need to make spheroidite, spheroidize the cementite, the, the spheroidize the cementite in the perlite. When you have this partitioning, yes, it means that you have to rearrange also not only the carbon and the not only the carbon has to uh, be redistributed but also the carbide the, the chromium or the manganese so that slows down the spheroidization reaction considerably yes so that this this um, um, has uh, this partitioning ha does have an, uh, a practical impact, okay? All right, but let's say a few words now about um, uh, precipitation and how do we describe this in... Um, uh, so it's just, this is just a little bit of um, in introduction. Don't worry too much about the math, but when you um, form a precipitate, yeah, so that we call this precipitate MX, uh, but for instance, it can be, uh, for instance, say aluminum, yes, plus 
instead of M and X, uh, nitrogen, yeah? aluminum plus nitrogen forming aluminum nitride. That, that's, um, that is a famous uh, precipitate. Or titanium, or let's say niobium, because we'll, we'll have that example in a moment. Niobium plus carbon, yes, forming niobium carbide, yes. So that is a, uh, well, to you it looks like a chemical reaction, but it actually is a precipitation reaction. Yeah? Aluminum in solution plus nitrogen in solution forms an aluminum nitride particle, yes? Niobium in solution, <coughs> carbon in solution forms niobium carbide particle, yes? It's, it's, it's clear, right? The, the, the meaning of this, it doesn't mean that I take a, one mole of pure niobium and one mole of pure nitrogen and I make a reaction. It doesn't mean that. It means I have aluminum in solution in steel and I have nitrogen in solution in steel and they form a precipitate. Hmm? When do they form a precipitate? Well, when the concentration is too high, yes? So, so with this reaction, precipitation reaction, I, have, I can have a free energy, uh, uh, just like any chemical reaction, yes? Product phase minus uh, starting phases, uh, free energy of the starting phases, and so that looks like this. Uh, so we get a... a standard values plus RT uh, natural log of the activity of my precipitate divided by the product of the activity of these uh, compounds, niobium and carbon, in solution, yes? Okay, when this reaction um, at equilibrium, is it equilibrium? We, mm, we have delta G is zero, and so I can rewrite this in this way. Hmm? where uh, this here so you know that the activity of a solid pure solid compound is one yes and um, we will assume that the activity of M can be written as the concentration of M yes same for X concentration of X Yes, and this these, this factor here I consider to be a constant, a, yes, constant a prime here, yes, and so I can rewrite this this equation here in something like this, yeah? and and this is basically a solubility equation. Hmm? The the form of this equation is that. Um, so, so it's log m times x is a divided by t plus b. So I can rewrite this m times x is 10 to the power a t plus b. Yeah, like this. And so I can. This is this looks like this in a. in a um, graphically, so if I put here M, so M is the concentration of that element in the steel, and X is the concentration of that element X in the steel, then uh, this here looks like this, it looks like this, um, okay. It's a curve that looks like this. And of course, there are different curves for different temperatures. T1, T2, T3. Different temperatures give me, because you can see A and B are constants, but T is a variable, yes? Um, so I get, and, and um, usually it's uh, such that um, as uh, the temperature uh, decreases, so T1 is smaller than T2 and T3. T2 is smaller than T3. Yes, uh, this line 
moves down. And, and so um, this is an example here for uh, niobium carbide. Yeah, so you have niobium, mass percent of niobium, and here carbon. And this is this equation, log niobium times carbon. Content is equal to A pl plus excuse me, B plus A over T. And, and you see here, A is, is uh, minus 6,770. Yeah? So, um, and the temperature is usually in Kelvin. Do you get this? And you see at different temperatures, this curve, um, as the temperature goes down, this curve uh, comes closer to the axis. Um, right, and... Whenever we have um, um, a steel, yes, we have a steel at a certain temperature and we have a certain composition, yes? So a certain composition. So any composition here, so for instance, so I have niobium and carbon and this is my this equation, the solubility line at a certain temperature, yes? So any, any composition, steel composition, I, I can put in this, in this graph, yes? Because this is the, just the, the mass percent of carbon, and here is the mass percent of niobium going from zero to whatever value. Hmm? Now, the imp what's important, yes, is that let's say hmm, we have a piece of steel, yes, and we have niobium atoms, I'll make the niobium a little bit larger, and carbon atoms, yes? Yeah. And say, I simplify the picture, I have three niobium atoms, yes, and um, six carbon atoms, right? Yeah. And now I'm reducing the temperature. Yes, I'm reducing the temperature, and at one moment, yes, um, I'm passing what's called the solubility temperature. So, what does that mean? I'm starting to make niobium carbide because I reach the supersaturation point. Yes, it's like having sugar, right? You put a lot of sugar in very hot coffee. Yes. Uh, it will, you can dissolve a lot. If you reduce the temperature, the, the sugar, if you have added a lot of sugar in your coffee, will start to crystallize out, yes? So, um, so you start to form niobium carbide. So this atom, yes, this atom will form niobium carbide, yes? When you reach the solubility curve, the solubility temperature, you do not, not everything precipitates. Just a fraction will, so, will precipitate. So at one temperature, you form this atom and this carbon form a compound, yes? The other ones are okay. They don't have to precipitate because the concentration in the solid has decreased when you form this, yes? In the, at the next temperature, two. The second atom has to go out of solution. Yeah? At a lower temperature, solubility decreases further, and I get the third atom, yes, etc. And of course, uh, at every point, I'm left with some excess carbon atoms who do not have to precipitate, yes? <coughs> okay, so what is important here hmm, is that the way the concentration changes, yes, the way the concentration changes is controlled by the stoichiometry of the compound, yes? So the composition of your steel 
the niobium and carbon content of your steel will always will so, so as when you precipitate say this is the starting uh, uh, composition yeah? as, as you precipitate the the composition of the steel moves along the niobium carbon composition yes of the steel moves along the stoichiometric line yes because uh, you always take one carbon atom and one nitrogen atom, carbon atom and one niobium atom out of solution. Yes? Okay. So how do we use this in practice? So we need a stoichiometric line and we need a solubility line. But what, what, what does this solubility line mean with respect to the composition? Yes? Okay, well, let, let me just show a simple example. All right. Say... Um, so I have this, this is basically the same graph, it's, not the, it's just the same, yes? But now, um, this is the solubility line at 1250, and this is the, this line here, right? And, um, and I've indicated uh, uh, on, uh, above this line is red, and below this line is blue, right? This is not difficult up to now. What does this mean if my composition is here? But say I have 0.06% um, of carbon and I have 0.25% uh, of uh, niobium in this steel. Yes? So I can put the composition here. Yes? And what, what it's in the red region. Yes? And that's, that's region means partially in solution. That means the niobium carbide is partially in solution. If the composition had been somewhere below this line, the blue, in the blue region, yes, it was fully in solution. So the solubility line that you calculate, yes, basically tells you your composition is below that line, yes, everything is in solution. Composition is above that line, some precipitation will occur. And, and how do you determine how much is um, um, precipitated? Well, so explain it here so again so the, uh, so you have for instance let's say niobium and carbon here yes the, we have a composition that's above this line yes hmm? at this temperature of course right you know this temperature will change yes let's just assume that uh, at 1400 degrees C, the line goes through this point, yes? Then this point is in the blue region, yes? Okay, so then it's fully in solution. But as I drop the temperature, it will become partially in solution. And how does it work? Well, I told you that the composition moves along the stoichiometric line. I'll, I'll, I'll so a, a specific line which is related to the composition of the compound. It means that every time I precipitate, I have one atom of niobium, one atom of carbon out of solution. Yes, And um, say the temperature is 1250. So I move along this. And this is the new composition of the solid of the, of the, um, of the uh, in this particular case, in, of the, the austenite. Yeah? Okay. The composition of the steel hasn't changed. Yes, it's just within the steel, the niobium has formed niobium carbide, and s some of it is still in solution. Right. So, when you reach this point, you don't the, the composition doesn't decrease anymore because it's that's that composition is in, can be in solution. Yeah, you reach the solubility line. So this much of niobium, this much of the niobium has formed niobium carbide. Hmm? Hmm? 
how do you calculate this stoichiometric line? Oh, I just need to go back. Yeah. Well, that's very simple. It's just basically the ratio, it's, it's a line going through your composition. The ratio is a molecular weight of niobium over the molecular weight niobium over the molecular weight of carbon. Hmm? Okay? Okay, so this is an example here. Hmm? So at, uh, this would be the composition here, the starting steel composition. So at 1250, uh, this is the amount of niobium that has, will be present as uh, niobium carbide. If I reduce the temperature further to 1100, then the composition of the solid, uh, of the austenite, uh, continues to decrease, and now I've the amount of niobium that has formed is, um, as niobium carbide is, um, has increased to this value here. And of course, yep. if this is, this is the total amount of niobium, niobium total, yeah. this is the amount of niobium present as niobium carbide, well then this is what? This is the niobium present as in solution, yeah? This is the amount of niobium in solution. So that's very useful uh, to have these solubility lines, yes? And um, these are available uh, for calculations this is, for instance, for a number of carbides in uh, ferrite and in austenite. And these are these parameters A and B, which allow you to basically calculate the solubility curve. Uh, and this is for some nitrites, OK? Good. And um, so what does this mean, for instance? Hmm? For instance, this is uh, a steel. 0.04% niobium, 0.08% of carbon, yes? Um, and we look at the amount of niobium that is in solution as a function of temperature. Well, um, so you, you have uh, 0.04, yes, niobium. So as I go from high temperature to low temperature, yes, nothing happens. And then when I reach 1150, that is the solubility line, and from that point onwards, the niobium in solution decreases, yes, because I form niobium carbide. I precipitate niobium carbide. Now, I've indicated here, yes, is a temperature range, 1200 to 1300, a little over to 1300. That temperature range is a typical temperature at which we reheat low-carbon steels. We reheat them at this particular temperature because at that temperature, yes, we dissolve all the precipitates, yes? And why do we do this? Because we want to control the way they precipitate afterwards. We control the way they precipitate, their size, and their distribution, yes? And in particular, this particular steel we want to make sure that niobium is in solution because it allows me to do thermomechanical processing of the steel. Okay, good. Um, let's um, start with um, a number of um, other, uh, a number of um, important points we want to make about the relation between alloying and, and strengthening, yes? And, and, and strength properties. Um, so we don't, again, we don't go into details here, but it's, it's important that um, you understand that we can use alloying to control transformations and change the microstructure, but why do we do this? Huh? Um, well, 
you know, one of the reasons we, d we change microstructure is to change the mechanical properties, yes? So, um, and, and here again, the composition comes into play, but in a slightly different, in slightly different way. And so let's, let's um, discuss the main points about the strengthening in relation to composition and microstructure. So steels, very important materials, uh, extremely widely used. One of the reasons is, uh, one of the technical reasons for that is we have a huge spread of properties in terms of strength. So you, you can have very, very soft uh, materials which go almost as low as um, 100 to 200 megapascals, so it's relatively soft, yes, and you can go all the way up to commercially, uh, you can buy four, three to four gigapascal steels, yes. That's a huge uh, breadth of properties, and so, and that's achieved by microstructure control and uh, through uh, composition and, and processing. Right, so, so what, what makes uh, uh, strength in steel? So, um, so we need to say something about uh, deformation, yes, first. So when you, um, you know, deform steel, um, macroscopically you don't see much, even if you do a um, uh, look at the microstructure with an optical microscope, it's not really... Uh, much to see, which, which would uh, tell you what's going on uh, to allow the deformation and, and, and why this deformation is in certain cases very difficult and in other cases easy in certain steels. Um, you need to look into the structure of the grain with transmission electron microscopy, for instance. Mm -hmm. And you can see in these, uh, at that uh, level of uh, magnification and resolution, you can see these black lines, and these are called dislocations, yes? And we will think of these dislocations as um, basically um, um, linear crystal defects, so they're linear because they're lines, yes? And, um, and, and we'll think about them for the sake of this particular course as having the following structure, yes? If you look into the, this crystal structure here, this uh, simple uh, cubic crystal structure, you can see that uh, these, this red row of atoms um, stops here, yes? And, um, and basically that this isn't like an extra half plane of atoms that's inserted in the lattice. Yes. Well, this type of defects, hmm, the, this, this here in the center, yes, hmm, is called a dislocation. Yeah. Um, uh, very far away, uh, where you inserted the extra half plane, um, the, the structure is, is basically the same. There is no lattice distortion. Yes. The lattice distortion is in the core of the dislocation. Yeah. And it is the motion of this dislocation which allows plastic deformation, yes? And strength is nothing but what causes the dislocation motion to be more difficult, yes? Okay, and these dislocations are in steels occur every time you do deformation. So, for instance, you do uh, a forging operation at high temperature. The, 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 the fundamental mechanisms that make the deformation of this forging possible uh, are dislocations, yes, at high temperatures or at low temperatures, yes? Okay? So again, or you look into, uh, you do a tensile uh, test, yes? Uh, if you look into uh, your microstructure at very high magnification, you will see that uh, what has happened is you've created a lot of dislocations and that, that has made the plastic deformation possible. Hmm? So we, the way we like to think about dislocations is um, in a formal way, yes, is by um, 
And this is a formal way of looking at dislocations, right? They're the way it actually happens in, in, uh, in, in polycrystalline steel is a little bit diff different, but for the sake of the discussion here, we, we can just um, have this uh, formal approach. So if, if we want to deform, say, a, a, one of the grains in our steel sample, uh, we need to somehow slip this top part with respect to the bottom part, yes? And we do this by introducing dislocation. So, so we, we basically push this an, an, uh, uh, crystal plane into the lattice, and we create an extra half plane in the process. And then this extra half plane moves across the crystal, yes, and comes out on this side. And when this has happened, yes, this crystal has become slightly larger, yes, permanently. So what has happened? Plastic deformation, yes. And what is strength? Strength is how difficult or easy it is to make this dislocation move. If it's difficult to move, then the crystal is strong, or the steel is strong. If it's easy to move, the crystal is softer. Okay. Now, it's very important uh, to realize that uh, what is actually moving through the crystal is not a, a, an extra half plane that, as it were, diffuses through the crystal. The only thing that ha really happens is a rearrangement of atomic bonds, and this is important, a rearrangement of atomic bonds at the core of this dislocation. So, so this, this is this extra half plane I talked about. So what gets rearranged is that this bond goes to here to connect these two atoms, yes? And when this has happened, this small rearrangement, the dislocation, the extra half plane, now looks like it has moved, yes? Whereas it hasn't moved at all, right? These atoms have just stayed. We've just rearranged the atomic bonding at the core of the dislocation. But when we do this, there is a small shift that goes through the lattice, yes, uh, which you can compare to the, to the way a, a snake moves. Yes? So when a snake uh, moves, it, it doesn't jump like this. No, it, it doesn't jump. It, it makes a little kink yes, in its tail, yes, and then the kink propagates. Yes? It's, this is the same what's happening here. This rearrangement of bonds, it's like a little kink that moves through the body of the snake, yes? And when the kink arrives at his head, the snake has moved up a little bit, yes? So it makes a propagating kink. The, the, uh, the dislocation is the same thing. So, yes? And, and again, you, you can see that if dislocations move on these uh, crystal planes, yes, they cause uh, she shear and, and you get permanent or plastic deformation. Same way the, um, the uh, uh, snake uh, moves, yes? Okay. All right. So, now, what happens when you have, um, when you deform a material, a steel, right? Well, one of the things you notice if you take a stress-strain curve is that the stress always increases. Yes? yes. It, so it's as if, you know, I'm deforming the material, and for some reason it gets stronger. Yes? It's, you would expect, well, you know, if, if I only have to get these dislocations to move, yes, why, why doesn't this stay flat? Yes? because it, they're all the same defects, yes? But obviously, um, there's something that happens which is called resistance to dislocation motion, yes? In this particular case, the reason why we have re increased resistance to dislocation motion is because all these dislocations start to interact with each other, yes? They cut each other, and so they act as obstacle to each other's motion, and that gives us strengthening, which is called strain hardening. Cut each other, 
And so they act as obstacle to each other's motion, and that gives us strengthening, which is called strain hardening. But there are other ways in which we can create um, uh, strength. Yes? So this, this is the idea of strength. Yes? Um, if you want to prevent a snake from moving, you just put a big stone on, on his head. Yes? He makes a kink, and then the kink stops at the stone. Yes? And the, or you don't need to put it on him. You can put it just in front of him also. In both cases, it will be harder for the snake to move. Yes? And it's similar with dislocation. Strength is obstacles to dislocation motion. And there are four ways, main ways, in which we strengthen the, uh, uh, steels. Hmm? We can strengthen by adding solutes, so composition dependent. The main solutes yes, um, that strengthen steels are phosphorus, silicon, and manganese. Yes? That's one way in which we can strengthen. Yes? The, the atoms can interact with the dislocation motion and uh, act as um, barriers to the motion and increase the strength. Yeah? So the, this strength is proportional to the content of solute, obviously, to a certain power n. n is usually 1. Or we, in steels, we can assume it's 1. Um, for those of you who are into theory, it doesn't necessarily have to be one, but one is the way, um, the, the, the exponent we like to use in, uh, in, in practice, engineering practice. Um, the other possibility is you increase the dislocation density. Yes, that's what we call strain hardening. More dislocations you have, the higher the yield strength of your steel. Mm -hmm. And there is a linear relation between the strength and the square root of the dislocation density. How many dislocations do I have per unit volume? The more I have, the more obstacles there are for other dislocations, and I get strengthening. Another way to increase the strength uh, that's very much used in the steel industry is the grain size. You reduce the grain size, you get strength. You don't need to change the composition. You don't need to add uh, deformation. Yes? You just reduce the grain size. And you probably know that the yield strength is, increases with reduction of the grain size proportional to 1 over the square root of D and that's the well-known Hall-Patch relationship. Hmm? Hmm? And finally, the, the, the fourth way we um, use to uh, increase strength is by adding precipitates. It's, in fact, very similar to this. It's just adding particles, yes, such as this rock in front or on top of the, the snake, yes, to prevent it from moving. And here we see that um, it's very much a function of the particle diameter. When the particle diameter is small, the strengthening increases considerably. And when I increase the volume fraction of precipitates, so higher volume fraction, I also increase the yield strength. Or I, so I will want to have a high density, high density, of tiny precipitates. I will want to have steel with small grain sizes. I may want to deform steel to strengthen it. And I may want to add phosphorus, silicon, or manganese to increase the strength. So certain of these things are related to alloying, deformation, or processing. Very often a combination of these three things. Okay, and that we'll, we'll be talking about this more in detail on, on Thursday. Thank you for your attention.